Hey everyone, Media Zealot has just launched a Patreon page, which will allow you guys to vote on which advanced sci-fi civilization you'd like to see next in the series. If you'd like to vote, click on the Patreon link in the video description, check out the terms and the other cool perks I can offer you guys. Any contribution will be greatly appreciated and will put me one step closer to making this channel my full-time pursuit. But of course, that's only if you're still feeling generous after watching episode 3. This video will no doubt draw the ire of a small minority of rabid fanboys. But you shouldn't hate me because I'm poking fun at your half-beloved franchise. You should hate me because I'm a prequel apologist. I can go early and fix up the baby's room. <laughs> It's the Galactic Empire. In the prequels we dare not speak of, we watch Palpatine expertly manipulate himself into position of Emperor in his newly formed First Galactic Empire. Not to mention he all but eradicates his main opposition, a mysterious cult of ancient space wizards. What does that mean? I'm not sure. Meditate on this. I will. His rise to power may be impressive, but this massive power grab is seemingly the exact moment Palpatine stopped kicking ass. Because although the Empire does grow to become unrivaled in size and military might, everything else has been slowly going downhill ever since. The Galactic Empire's stats look impressive, boasting 1.5 million official member worlds and 100 quadrillion citizens. All kept under control by an unparalleled military force backed by a near endless supply of resources. This enormous autocratic militarized nightmare has somewhat conservative leanings however, opting for modest, practical cod pieces compared to our other evil empires. Instead, these guys overcompensate with bulbous phallic helmets, pulsating red laser swords, and gargantuan balls. The classic movie series that I couldn't watch without wondering if every single scene had been completely replaced with CGI. <laughs> George Lucas may not allow his movies to naturally age, but George, you can chill, because any technical shortcomings in the original trilogy could never compare to the design idiocy of the Galactic Empire itself. Point 1. Design flaws. Design flaws. Design flaws. Poor training and pointless retcons. Really? Grumpy Emperor Palpatine didn't get enough cuddles as a child, and now he's throwing his toys at the rest of the galaxy. The size and might of the Empire's armed forces is mind-boggling to say the least. They rely on overwhelming force to crush their enemies, while maintaining an iron grip over the populace. But unfortunately, the rapid expansion of the Empire's military might, and their choice to focus on mass production and cocky displays of authority, has forced them to cut quite a few corners in pursuit of... Let's start with the TIE Fighters, which are perhaps the best example of the Empire's sacrifice of quality for quantity. These things by their very nature were designed for mass production and mass deployment, both of which would have been considerable advantages if not for the fact the TIE Fighters are basically flying cannon fodder. I'd run away from a swarm of mosquitoes too, but these things end up being more an annoyance than anything else. They don't even have life support, shields, or faster than light travel. If their support ships are lost, the TIE Fighter pilots better hope they are near a habitable world, or else they're completely screwed. They also obviously can't catch any ship that has a reliable hyperdrive. Probably why they keep picking on this old piece of junk. I'm glad you're here to tell us these things. Chewie, take the professor in the back and plug him into the hyperdrive. <laughs> The field of vision of your average TIE Fighter pilot is about as long as their lifespan. Sure, the TIE Fighter's cockpit may have visual monitors and sensors to compensate for blind spots. I do not accept that explanation. So why then is this tiny craft's favourite pastime dashing itself to bits against canyon walls and each other, while larger rebel ships navigate their way through the tighter spots without issue? But perhaps we don't even need design flaws to explain the TIE Fighter's capacity to destroy themselves because the pilots themselves are said to be suicidal due to Imperial brainwashing. Unfortunately, things don't get much better when we visit the home base of the TIE Fighters, the Star Destroyers, and Super Star Destroyers. These monstrosities are impressive feats of engineering for the most part, but like most other Imperial tech, there are some fairly obvious problems with their design. 
Take their extremely conspicuous bridges for example. For some reason, they're designed like seafaring ships that need to visually monitor for icebergs. Or unrealistic asteroid fields. The Empire should have the tech to bury that bridge under armour. Sensors. But currently, it makes such a tantalising target, you'd be a fool not to pop off a few shots. Hell, you could probably disorient a few Imperial pilots and smash a whole squadron of TIE fighters straight into this thing. Just shoot this thing first and the shields are gone, then inflict a moderate amount of damage to decapitate the beast and bring this whole thing down. I mean literally down. In a microgravity environment. Downwards. The Imperial officers and ground forces don't fare much better either. During times of war, the Empire often rushes the training of stormtroopers and officers, shipping them off to the front line of the earliest opportunity. The officers may survive for a while, at least until they get promoted, but a fair number of stormtroopers are ill-prepared for their immediate situation, and could be suffering from an extreme aversion to killing. Their fairly low accuracy rating could be completely intentional, if they can see out of their helmets at all, that is. I can't see a thing in this helmet. And their cod pieces aren't quite as useful as I originally thought. Meanwhile the rebels get a conveniently faceless bowling pin like enemy that they can just plug away at with ease. I don't even blame the stormtroopers for their at times questionable accuracy and lack of battle preparedness. They've been set up to fail from the very beginning. Half the stormtroopers we see could very well be nervy battle virgins. It's no wonder they apparently all have weak minds. You don't need to see his the Imperial troops with the benefit of armoured cover are not much safer either. The AT-ATs are the Empire's primary heavily armoured ground vehicle and while they may have some impressive features, they also have some noticeable drawbacks. Heavy armour and blasters are fine, but these things are seriously hindered by the fact they can only fire forwards. If only the rebels would learn how to flank. They can also be defeated by any old piece of cable you happen to have just lying around. It's like a painfully slow, uncoordinated mechanical horse. A Trojan horse that trips over its own feet and blows up before it reaches the city gates, double crossing its own side and becoming conveniently explosive the moment its body touches the ground. Because just like a real horse, this thing is probably going to die if it lies down for an extended period of time. Actually, it's more like an ass. Definitely an ass. Is this clankety ass tank designed to wipe out a tidy nugget of Imperial troops and bankrupt the Empire in the process? Because it sure seems like it. These Imperial ass clankers are apparently designed to plop out troops across the battlefield, but their primary purpose may be to further the Empire's display of power and their production may have been hasty due to the need to just get some form of heavy ground vehicle out there. Again, this thing conforms with the Empire's ideology of using an ill-equipped suicide force designed to crush enemies through endless waves of Imperial forces. Can't they just walk these things in the parades but then deploy some serious military assets on the front line? The Empire continues its design trend of making ground assault vehicles with the mannerisms of inbred farm animals with these rickety chicken walkers. ATSTs. These things are fairly effective at rooting out enemy infantry and are apparently designed to cover the flanks of ATATs. But again, like most other Imperial hardware, these gumby little hatchlings have some serious weaknesses. They are easily taken out by heavy ordnance, including rocket fire and laser cannons, or just try logs. They are also useless against heavily armoured ground vehicles and struggle against any type of ground vehicle that isn't within close range. But you probably won't need all that because an adorable militia of cuddly teddy bears defeated a battalion of these guys using nothing but sticks and stones. Now, there are plenty of Imperial starships, troops and ground vehicles that are better equipped than the ones we've looked at, but the reality is, the vehicles, ships and infantry we've highlighted make up the majority of Imperial forces. So therefore, the majority of their forces have severe weaknesses that can be easily learned and preyed upon by their enemies. But surely the Empire's most powerful weapon won't suffer these same sorts of drawbacks? Enter the Death Star. 
Much has been made over the years about the apparent design weaknesses of the Death Star, a moon-sized weapons platform that can be destroyed by firing a proton torpedo down a small exhaust port on its exterior. The interior of the Death Star then somehow magically guides the projectile directly to the reactor system, and the whole thing goes boom killing a decent chunk of the Imperial Command in the process. The Rebels strike their greatest blow against the Empire, who move quickly to remedy their mistakes by building another Death Star, this time with larger ports big enough for an X-Wing to fly through. That would have been fine since Death Star 2 was still under construction, but then they go ahead and invite the Rebels to come have a crack at it. The destruction of the second Death Star may be more due to stupid managerial decisions that we'll pick apart later, but the first Death Star is a legitimate polished turd, right? Not anymore because Disney retconned the shit out of that Imperial era with the recent hit movie Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. Jam-packed with so many classic Star Wars vehicles, fanboys may require multiple fapping sessions. This movie is a fun, action-packed ride with exciting set pieces, lush, realistic-looking CGI, and overly simplistic plot. We need a map. Well, I'm sure there's one just lying about. And some interesting acting methods. And the whole system goes down. That's how you said it. The most interesting characters are a despicable self-entitled villain MY ACHIEVEMENT and a soulless robot. Are you talking about me? It's a film that seemingly exists only to turn a catastrophic design flaw into an intentional rebel ploy. But unfortunately, they only managed to replace one catastrophic form of stupidity with another. We discover that Galen Erso, who was being forced to work on the Death Star project for years, secretly created a weakness in the Death Star's reactor which would allow the Rebels to completely destroy it with ease, and then delivered the information straight to the Rebels. It's really the whole exhaust port thing that seemed like the most serious flaw. You know, the exhaust port that guides torpedoes straight to the reactor system? That was kind of the whole thing there. A reactor blowing up after being struck by an explosive is believable enough, I thought. I'm not sure which design flaw you think you're fixing here. This all would have been forgivable if Galen Erso was just some run-of-the-mill Imperial who decided to betray the Empire in some epic long con. But unfortunately, Galen Erso practically had Rebel written all over him from the very beginning. Director Krennic tracked down Galen, who was hiding on a backwater planet, after he left the Death Star project because of his strong ideological opposition to it. And then douchebag Krennic goes ahead and kills his wife. This guy's probably now suicidal. I don't think he's gonna care if he goes down fighting the Empire. Krennic and the other Imperial superiors then fall hook, line, and sinker for obvious Rebel Galen's beat and man routine and allow him massive influence and autonomy over their most important and secret project ever. Galen seems like he had so much independence, the Empire are lucky he didn't rig the Death Star to blow when it busted its first nut. Even after it becomes apparent to both Vader and Grandma Tofkin that this Galen guy has leaked sensitive information if not fully sabotaged the Death Star, no one seems to do much except throw blame around. Assure the Emperor that Galen Erso has not compromised this weapon in any way. He was dispatched from the installation on Edo, Galen Erso's facility. Krennic, to his credit. MY ACHIEVEMENT! at least tried to investigate after being tipped off by Tofkin and threatened by Vader. What brings you to Scout? Galen Erso. I want every dispatch, every transmission he has ever sent called up for inspection. But then Grandma just rocks up and blows the whole place to bits. So much for investigating what happened. They should have been looking over the Death Star specs with a fine tooth comb, but instead they go through with the project exactly as Galen intended. Overlooking design flaws is the Empire's most consistent military strategy. I find the accidentally flawed original Death Star far more believable than this cacophony of incompetence with Galen. Or perhaps they are gonna fix all their other design problems with more pointless movies. But there are actually reasons Vader and Tofkin may have purposefully withheld the relevant information, and that is because of problems with the Empire administration itself. Point 2. Their dysfunctional and excessively cruel system guarantees widespread rebellion. Mistakes and insubordination become institutionalized. The Empire employs overarching ideological strategies that immediately alienate vast sections of their own citizenry, 
For a start, their awkward displays of masculinity are somewhat pointless without the appropriate audience. It's safe to say that Empire suffers from a distinct lack of female talent at almost every level. So assuming most aliens have some sort of gender binary going on, that's approximately half the population that is automatically somewhat irked with the Empire. These galactic fascists also enforce a humans first policy, where aliens are treated as second class citizens, and can only serve within the Empire under exceptional circumstances. Humans are encouraged to look down on aliens, and this humans first policy is said to extend to most areas of the galactic empire. Okay, so now all aliens are pretty pissed off with the empire, all human women and sympathetic human men are somewhat irked, that leaves a tiny sliver of the population who are the only ones left that won't have grievances with the empire from the starting gate. And let's not even get started on the massive tax burden created by the perpetually exploding imperial forces. The government has its filthy mitts in everyone's pockets, believe you me. The Empire relies on fear and propaganda to hold sway over its many inhabitants, using its massive military force to keep everyone in line. Actually, they don't so much keep people in line, more so they blow the crap out of someone standing quietly in line for little or no reason. Over the years, the Empire has subjugated and enslaved populations, committed genocide and other atrocities, and pushed populated planets to the point of ecological disaster. They even destroyed Alderaan, a peaceful planet of 2 billion people without warning. All for the crimes of a few of Alderaan's citizens. The Empire were attempting to demonstrate the power of their new weapon, but all they demonstrated is that attempting to live peacefully under Empire rule is an exercise in futility. Not to mention, dealing a massive blow to the Empire's system of power and control just became a whole lot simpler. Now the singular and obvious thing everyone brave needs to do is destroy the Death Star. It may be able to destroy planets, but it's also got the biggest target in the galaxy painted right on it. Now that the Senate has been dissolved, relying on the Death Star is a highly risky and unnecessary centralization of power. And we know how that usually works out. Even your average Imperial citizen living in the outlying worlds doesn't get a good deal living under the Empire. Here, the Stormtroopers are the main enforcers of Empire rule and they're said to use a shoot first policy. Some citizens' sole experience of the Empire would be to watch them drop by, massacre their loved ones and leave, never to be seen again. All it takes is a plucky young nerf herder or a disgruntled moisture farmer and voila, more rebels for the cause on planets with little empire oversight. Luke Skywalker is the prime example. He was ready to sign up to the academy and take his place in the imperial machine. And if these new droids do work out, I want to transmit my application to the academy this year. Then they land and unnecessarily killed his last remaining family. Why couldn't they just seize the droids and leave without a fuss? They didn't know Uncle Watts' face was a rebel sympathizer. The droids just randomly ended up there. Now Luke, and anyone like him, have nothing left but to dedicate their lives to revenge. Grandma Tofkin, Vader, and all the other galactic fascists Fire! are gallivanting around the galaxy, achieving little more than sparking a whole bunch of homegrown rebellions. The Death Star itself is practically a rebel creating machine. The extremely oppressive, violent and unpredictable nature of Empire rule leaves its citizens with a choice between subjugation or a chance at freedom through rebellion. It wouldn't even be a choice to many. It's no wonder the rebels seem unstoppable. Their existence is a completely natural and inevitable reaction to unreserved tyranny. Probably the best evidence we have for how many people truly hated the Empire is when we see the Empire inevitably fall. The Empire's capital planet, Coruscant, is seen openly celebrating its fall. There seems to be almost no one who was legitimately loyal. Tatooine, who besides suffering the occasional random slaughter, had minimal interference from the Empire, are loving its collapse. Even Emperor Palpatine's homeworld, Naboo, is acting like it's the 4th of July. That is billions upon billions of people who were at least sympathetic to the rebel cause. But maybe if you're still enduring the Empire before its downfall, you could try to cut some sort of dodgy deal to keep them off your back. Don't bother. You can expect them to change the terms of the agreement on a whim, or completely disregard it and take all your stuff by force. Lord Vader, what about Leia and the Wookiee? They must never again leave this city. 
That was never a condition of our agreement, nor was giving hand to this bounty hunter. It would be unfortunate if I had to leave a garrison here. Lando knows this. This deal is getting worse all the time. Take the princess and the Wookiee to my ship. You said they'd be left in the city under my supervision. I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. He was so slimy, he was willing to sell out his friends. But then even one such as he is given no choice but to rebel against the Empire. You're a real hero. Another rebel for the cause, this time the influential leader of a city. But there is one man who did manage to get a mutually beneficial deal with the Imperials. It's Boba Fett, a ruthless murderous bounty hunter. He can work for whoever he wants to, can come and go as he pleases, and even gets compensated for lost bounties. What if he doesn't survive? He's worth a lot to me. The Empire will compensate you if he dies. Put him in. Vader delivers everything exactly as promised. More than that, they're totally bros. In fact, Boba gets treated better than anyone within the Imperial ranks themselves. Besides maybe Grandma Tofkin, he's way slicker than your average Empire dupe, and therefore he gets abused and yelled at less often. But everything and everyone else in the Empire are treated as expendable resources. This is a cutthroat, vicious work environment like a slightly less idiotic version of the Cyclo system. They basically kill anyone who fails a few missions, or maybe you just fail to deliver a project in time. It doesn't matter if you were at fault or not. Have a few bad days at work and you're Vader fodder. Within the Empire's military command structure exists a pervasive climate of fear, and with their casual attitude towards violence and murder, no one really even needs a reason to take you out. The oppressive working environment and constant threat of death is really not a great method of maintaining an efficient and effective command structure. Anyone below Vader is basically working in a chain of command that promotes dishonesty and deception towards superiors and colleagues. Apology accepted, Captain Nida. If your life was at stake, would you tell your superior the bad news and risk death? Or would you take the best options available? Lie your ass off, cover it up, downplay events, blame someone else, or maybe even create a little drama to keep your superiors distracted. Mistakes and bad practices don't get structural or cultural fixes within the Empire. Deceitfulness and failure to learn from mistakes actually become institutionalized as normal practice. Their system stifles any chance they have to adapt, learn, and improve. Mistakes may not be tolerated on an individual basis, but they definitely are tolerated in regards to the Empire never learning from them. No wonder the more adaptable rebels are able to take them out against all odds. While there technically may have been a senate for most of the Empire's existence, it is a vestigial remnant of the old world that the Emperor was just waiting to dissolve. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. The real leadership of the Empire is the Emperor at its head, Vader below him, and the military-like command structure below, who are unlucky enough to answer to these freaks. Yes. I say military-like, but honestly, the Empire's similarity with the military starts and ends with them having weapons. A few fancy-sounding ranks and some nifty little pins and badges peppered all over their Nazi uniforms. Because in reality, the Empire probably wouldn't measure up well against many Earth militaries. In terms of commitment to command systems and rational thought processes that make victory more likely, not practices that make failure inevitable. Everyone is walking on eggshells the moment Vader walks in the room, just wondering who he'll blame next. These Imperial officers are probably so nervous all the time, not only are they inclined to make decisions based on self-preservation, they'd be prone to making mistakes in general. But he asked the impossible. I need more men. Then perhaps you can tell him when he arrives. The Emperor's coming here? And he is most displeased with your apparent lack of progress. We shall double our efforts. I hope so, Commander, for your sake. This guy is just being honest. He needs more men. Forget reality, though. The Emperor is coming. I wonder how many corners he cut to be ready in time. This guy sneers angrily at his underling for getting something right. Any good supervisor would be happy that he is progressing well, but simply showing him up in front of Vader makes this boss one step closer to a chokeout. And he was dead right. These guys think it's okay to just let an escape pod get away. They came here to find some plans. Why, of course it could be on that ship. 
There goes another one. Hold your fire. There's no life forms. They must have short circuited. It's not like this universe has semi intelligent robots that could avoid life sign scanners. How rude! Is Plasma Blaster ammo something that the Empire needs to conserve? It sure doesn't seem like it. Despite Vader's ruthlessness, he fails to point out this obvious mistake. Lord Vader, the battle station plans are not aboard this ship, and no transmissions were made. An escape pod was jettisoned during the fighting, but no life forms were aboard. She must have hidden the plans in the escape pod. Set a detachment down to retrieve them. See to it personally, Commander. There will be no one to stop us this time. Yes, sir. It's great that he's finally not screaming about it for once, but to avoid such errors in the future, the specifics of what caused this cock-up need to be addressed constructively. But obviously, it pays not to stand out within the Imperial ranks. Doing your job properly could get you a promotion, and trust me, that's the last thing you want. Your best bet is to sink into the woodwork and do as little as possible. That's because any sort of career advancement will inevitably place you on the Vader career conveyor belt of death. Be careful not to choke on your aspirations, Director. First you give your important insights to Vader, next you're his go-to guy, and then you're dead. I wouldn't say a damn thing. It's probably best to pretend you have a complete lack of leadership skills and initiative. These guys merely exist as the personal footstools of Vader, sometimes the Emperor, and if you're having a good day, one of your less insane but equally snarky superiors will be doing the screaming. Admiral Piat, who credit to him lasts longer than your average supervisor, in fact he survives between two movies. This guy seems legitimately competent and does everything Vader commands to a T, with minimal backtalk. But Vader berates Piat constantly for what is really his own strategic mistakes. Lord Vader, our ships have completed their scan of the area and found nothing. Calculate every possible destination along the last known trajectory. Yes, my lord, we'll find them. Don't fail me again. Admiral. Alert all command. When Piat does finally get given what seems like his last warning, he nervously plays with his glove as he contemplates what to do. Of course, this could be the point where he decides to betray the Empire and make a run for it. But instead, his decision leads to an equally bad outcome for the Empire. Deploy the fleet. He decides to deploy the fleet to search for the Millennium Falcon, a reckless use of resources that will leave the Empire vulnerable. Surviving in the lower ranks of the Empire is even harder. Stormtroopers are under threat of death from all sides, sent on suicide missions on the whim of some guy they've never met. Like all Imperials, the Stormtroopers' morale would be extremely low, so low they'd be messing up the basics of their job. Doors locked, move on to the next one. And I guess a fair number of them would be going AWOL at the first available opportunity. Hell, maybe some of them are so depressed they get killed on purpose. The Empire also regularly indulges in activities that immediately alienates ethnic populations within their own ranks. Alderanians serve within the Empire, possible future traitors and rebel defectors just biding their time. The rebels are far more welcoming to people of dubious backgrounds. They don't care too much if you used to work for the Empire. They'll welcome you with open arms and you can live without the constant threat of death. You just have to be willing to kick some Empire ass. But you can pretty much just come and go as you please with the added bonus of being able to call up your rebel buddies when you need help kicking said Empire butt. Freedom. When choosing between working for the Rebel Alliance and the Empire, it's barely a choice. And now we come back to Retcon 1 and super obvious rebel scum Galen Urso. Next to Grandma Tofkin and Krennic, this Galen guy has the greatest longevity of any Imperial officer we've ever known. Krennic doesn't really need Urso, but obviously he has to speed up the Death Star project and save his own neck. It's a typically irrational yet normal move for any Imperial officer. After Galen is known to have partaken in some nefarious rebel business, everyone seems too scared to disrupt the Emperor's day with their suspicions. They may also be working towards their own agendas, or perhaps none of these guys actually want the Empire to succeed. Tofkin may have just got sick of everyone's shit and chose to go down in a blaze of glory on the first Death Star. This catastrophic event, brought about by the Empire's own mismanagement, was a massive blow to Imperial forces. Though it did not cause the Empire's complete collapse, no, to do that you just have to destroy the Death Star and two extra people. Or you could just kill those two people by themselves, that would probably work too. Point 3. The Sith's stranglehold on the Empire assures its timely destruction. Whatever you say, I've done more than I bargained for on this trip already. 
And finally, we come to the evil Imperial Space Wizard himself, Darth Sidious, or Emperor Palpatine. If there is anyone to blame for this entire mess, it's him. Palpatine spends most of his days brooding in epic gothic chambers. Now that he's the Emperor, he's got all the toys he ever wanted, and I swear he's lacking in the motivation department. He's struggling for purpose in a vanquished galaxy. I bet he even calls Mace Windu's name in his sleep. Oh, I, 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 I... He grumbles about the foolishness of the Jedi with almost a sense of longing nostalgia. Jedi. Nowadays, even simple ruses that happen under his watch get missed. It's no wonder though, because he barely interacts with the command team and gets half his vital information from Vader, a man that he deeply distrusts. Sure, Palpatine always has an entourage of nefarious lackeys, but I wouldn't be surprised if their intel was just as shonky as everyone else's. Anyone delivering bad news to the Emperor is liable to get their ass covered in lightning bolts. You failed, your highness. The Emperor relies heavily on the Force when making his most important decisions. I have felt him, my master. Strange that I have not. He will come to me. I have foreseen it. But besides getting a few feels every now and again, he doesn't seem to be able to use the Force to find out anything tangible. Say, that Galen sabotaged the Death Star. And oh yeah, the fact that basically everyone in his own organization is constantly withholding information from him. The Emperor makes all of his decisions based on incomplete information and various feelings or hunches he has. Needless to say, it's an unbelievably crappy way to run anything at all, let alone a sprawling galactic empire. The Emperor is a lazy SOB who entrusts everything except the most massive calls to a large group of incompetent, terrified people that he never associates with, let alone trusts. He would have no idea what is actually happening in his organization, other than just occasionally getting a case of the bad feels. But he doesn't really care what happens anyway, as long as the problem is taken care of. And by taking care of, I don't mean fixing the problem, I mean murdering a patsy and carrying on business as per usual. And even when Palpatine gets more hands-on, his skills in manipulation and deception seem to have waned in recent years. Everything that has transpired has done so according to my design. He gives the Rebels the location of the second Death Star and its shield generator on Endor. Okay, that wasn't very clever. The Rebels would always have assumed the Death Star was going to be heavily defended. They went in there expecting a battle. And now they know exactly where to attack. They still have a fairly decent chance considering their track record was surgical strikes. If the Emperor really wanted to create a trap, he should have made a dummy shield generator for the Rebels to attack. And then Palpatine is even silly enough to show up and put himself in harm's way. But perhaps the most serious problem with the Emperor's way of running the Empire is his adherence to archaic doctrine. It's treason, then. Darth Sidious is a Sith Lord, which means he's a completely unreasonable prick who hates any form of union that doesn't involve two men. <laughs> right. He also seemingly endorses Vader's policy of compulsory asphyxiation for all subordinates. The Sith's rule of two compels them to have only two members at any one time. It's an ancient doctrine designed to preserve the order, allow them to remain undetected, and prevent serious infighting. But unfortunately, the doctrine also states there is always to be a master to embody the power of the dark side of the Force, and an apprentice to crave it. And the Sith we see follow that last bit of philosophy to the letter. Because despite the original intent of the Rule of Two, these guys partake in some pretty serious infighting. Take your father's place at my side. Except now an entire galactic civilization depends on the continued existence of these two vicious, superstitious maniacs. Obviously, the dysfunctional relationship between Sith Lord and Master hasn't stayed isolated. The Sith's behavior and stranglehold on the Empire is responsible for contaminating the entire command structure with its oppressive taint. This nefarious Sith relationship is the root cause of nearly all of the Empire's inadequacies. The Emperor likes to constantly threaten Invader's position as his apprentice, and is always on the lookout for someone cooler who can prove themselves by murdering Vader. The Emperor plays little mind games with everyone, tempting Luke into striking him, but it was all just a ruse to test Luke's commitment to the dark side, while also a veiled threat towards Vader, who he was completely relying on to stop the blow. 
Vader is just as much of a footstool as anyone else in this organization. He has to deal with all of the Emperor's little tantrums about rebels and the Jedi. But he of course also has his own secret agenda. He's had a plan from the very beginning to seize the Emperor's power for himself. I am more powerful than the Chancellor. I, I can overthrow him. Which according to Sith doctrine is a completely natural although reckless succession of Sith power. Oh, and of course, Vader wants his own apprentice too. Join me, and together we can rule the galaxy as father and son. The Emperor at least has some sort of political and leadership nous, but Darth Vader is a woefully unqualified murderous asshole, who also relies too heavily on the Force when making important decisions. You remember how much of a whiny little rat-tailed punk that Anakin guy was before he suited up? Tell us now! One minute he's prepping the baby's room, the next minute he's massacring a bunch of Jedi Sproglets. And remember how arrogant and entitled he was for two full movies, arguably three? What? Don't look back. This is seriously not the guy you promote to supervisor. He's overly critical. It's not fair. Vader has not the skills nor qualities to rule the vast galactic empire, and I dare say neither does Palpatine or his former apprentice Darth Maul. Count Dooku, another of Sidious's former apprentices, and a man much older than the Emperor himself, may have had some semblance of rational leadership ability. But of course he is inevitably betrayed by Sidious, Do it. who prefers his apprentices young and supple. Some consider to be unnatural. Even if a natural succession of power did somehow occur, it's very doubtful any such apprentice could have kept control over the devious moths and other imperial officers. Especially since they already distrust the religious nature of the Sith Order. Don't try to frighten us with your sorcerer's ways, Lord Vader. I'd wager if the Emperor was usurped or did manage to hand the reins to one of his inadequate apprentices. The Galactic Empire would have splintered in a very similar manner to what we see in The Force Awakens. Maybe this rule of two system worked when the Sith were operating in the shadows, but now it almost seems like a guarantee that the Sith Order would naturally collapse at some point, after Master and Apprentice kill each other in a catastrophic event, or a catastrophic event orchestrated by their enemies. Hell, the Sith Master could die and the Apprentice defects to the light side of the Force, or dies from another event before managing to train an Apprentice. There are a range of probable scenarios that would easily see the Sith extinct. And even after every Death Star is destroyed and the two Sith dead, the Emperor himself was too stupid to continue to exist. The Jedi had long achieved a method of life after death, while the Emperor who was obsessed with immortality is seemingly just gone for good. Even Vader can commit one selfless act and boom, he's an immortal space ghost. And need I remind you, he cut down a daycare full of toddlers and spent 24 years slaughtering his way across the galaxy. So of course, with the Emperor gone and the Sith destroyed, the Empire immediately falls into disarray and fragments into a range of different factions not long after. But an Imperial Remnant remains, a group that later becomes known as the First Order. But unfortunately for them, they aspire to be just like the Empire and therefore seem dedicated to repeating its mistakes. Thanks for watching guys, just a reminder MediaZella is now live on Patreon. Click the link in the video description for your chance to vote on which stupid advanced sci-fi civilization features next in the series. And also check out the other perks on offer. Thanks so much for watching my stuff right through to the end, see you in the next vid.